1929, for instance, when Keynes had suggested this, that the state should intervene to generate demand, this had been opposed in Britain. In the United States, in the midst of the Depression, when Roosevelt came up with his New Deal, uh, there was a lot of opposition. The New Deal did temporarily get the U.S. out of the recession uh, to, to, to a significant extent, but then immediately the argument was put forward that, okay, now that the U.S. has got out of the recession, the government should stop spending under the New Deal. Because of which in 1937, and the, and the government did that, and because of that in 1937, there was a further recession in the United States. Actually, the capitalist world came out of the Great Depression only because of the war expenditures. Uh, countries like Japan and Germany, which had fascist governments, came out of the war earlier because the fascist government started military expenditures in Japan in 1931, in Germany in 1933. Uh, but the other uh, countries came out of the war only when, in response to the fascist threat, they started militarizing, that is, roughly around 1938-9. The question, therefore, that first arises is how come that given this opposition which had been there earlier to state activism in demand management, this opposition was overcome in the post-war period. How come we actually had the golden age of capitalism? Uh, now, I think, to my mind, that's because there was a very important change in the correlation of class forces in most advanced countries after the war. The working class, which had actually made great sacrifices during the war, was not willing to go back to the days of unemployment and depression. And in many of these countries, the, the social and political weight of the working class increased dramatically after the war. In Britain, you remember uh, Winston Churchill, who had been the wartime prime minister, lost the elections after the war, and a Labour government was elected. Likewise, in France and other countries, you actually had very strong left-wing movements, communist, social democratic, that actually uh, came up in a, in, a, in a big way. So the post-war period saw a very serious threat which capitalism faced in the metropolitan countries, particularly in Europe, from the fact that there was, of course, a very strong anti-colonial struggle that took place at the same time. There was an upsurge of anti-colonial struggle and at the same time you actually had domestic political challenges to the hegemony of, 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 of the existing order. I think it is in this context that one can understand that the new socialist or social democratic or labor government that came into power being able to pursue a number of policies which earlier would not have been allowed. And I think state intervention in demand management to raise the level of employment in the economy was one such. So I would see it as a concession or, 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 or a shift that was introduced because the parameters in which capitalism functioned after the war were quite different from what had happened in an earlier period. Uh, in Europe, as I said, this government intervention, state intervention, took the form of larger welfare expenditures, while in the United States it took the form, above all, of larger military expenditures. But nonetheless, in the US, in the Kennedy years, unemployment was down to 4% of the workforce officially, and in, in Europe, in Britain, for instance, it was down to 2% of the total workforce. Remarkably low figures given the history of capitalism. And that, in turn, is something which gave rise to the um, golden age of capitalism. Now, but I think within this itself, changes were taking place that were to undo the golden age. I don't want to go too much into details, but one very obvious example I'll give you. That example is that under the Bretton Woods system, which was set up uh, you know, in the post-war period to look after the international monetary system. Uh, 
the dollar was declared to be as good as gold. In other words, you couldn't go back to a gold standard. You had a new system where the dollar was as good as gold. 35 ounces, that says it's 35 dollars per ounce of gold was the official price uh, of, 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 of the dollar in terms of gold under the Bretton Woods system. Now what happened under the Bretton Woods system therefore is that the United States was virtually sitting on a gold mine because after all the dollar was supposed to be as good as gold and everybody was more or less obliged to hold on to dollars and they didn't think of it as necessarily being as good as gold. So the US spent huge amounts of money not only in setting up a string of military bases all around the globe but what is more also in many American companies taking over European companies which printed dollars. The, the French writers, Corrigan Jacques Servan Schreiber, who wrote a book called The American Challenge, which was actually discussing this very phenomenon. You had therefore the US running into not just a fiscal deficit, but a current account deficit on the balance of payments. And there was a huge outflow of dollars from the United States, which the rest of the world was holding on. This reached even greater proportions during the Vietnam War because effectively what the US did is that in financing the Vietnam War, it again printed dollars and those dollars were held by the rest of the capitalist world. So these huge amounts of dollars formed as it were the basis of the euro dollar market because a lot of European banks had all these dollars with them. So first there was the euro dollar market that developed and then they wanted to invest these dollars all over the world. But this was prevented under the Bretton Woods system because of the fact that there were capital controls that you could not just kind of, you know, uh, invest dollars anywhere else. A financial investment of dollars is something which was not freely allowed under the system. So pressure built up against this system and in particular given the Vietnam War and the US fiscal deficits and current account deficits, you also had a pressure of an inflationary kind in the world economy because, you know, obviously uh, the world had low levels of unemployment and at the same time war expenditures increased and this put pressure of an excess demand on the available world resources because of which they were inflationary pressures. And, and, and besides, as, as I was saying earlier, trade unions were quite strong in a situation of low unemployment and the strengths tend to increase. You know, in other words, if low unemployment is maintained over a long period of time, then that gives rise to uh, larger trade union strength. So for all these reasons, in other words, excess demand pressures giving rise to inflation that erode to an extent the real wages in a situation where workers' bargaining strength is something which is, would not accept these real wages which, which have been somewhat reduced because of inflation uh, owing to the high levels of employment. So in 1968, there was a world wage explosion. Then there was, because of the world wage explosion uh, and the dollars coming into the hands of various European banks and European governments, uh, there was a pressure to convert these dollars into gold, which under Nixon then meant that the gold link was snapped. Then Nixon said, we cannot convert all these into dollar, uh, into gold, and, 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 and therefore the Bretton Woods system collapsed. When the Bretton Woods system collapsed, there was a rush to holding primary commodities, and therefore there's a huge primary commodity boom. So all over the world, therefore, there was a kind of period of financial turmoil. And the financial turmoil not only meant the end of the Bretton Woods system, but the financial turmoil also meant that when the world settled down subsequently, the restrictions on financial flows, global financial flows which had existed earlier, were no longer there. In, 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 in other words, those restrictions had to go because, as I said, European banks had lots of dollars they wanted to in, in, invest them all over. There was in fact a period of one, what many economists call loan pushing, 
that you actually pushed loans because you, you had all those dollars and you wanted to give loans to all kinds of countries, including third world countries and third world governments, etc. But the upshot is that the regime of relatively stable currency values and the regime in which uh, you had capital controls is something that gave way to an alternative regime when its capital controls were removed. There were global financial flows which were permitted in, and global capital flows together with uh, floating exchange rates. Europe saw this first, particularly in the late 1960s, and uh, then this came to Africa and Latin America, and then finally it came to India in the 1990s when, when we also opened up our economy uh, to the free flow of, of, of capital, free flow of finance, and removed foreign exchange controls to a very significant extent. Uh, so the, the, the question of why is to do with the fact that in a sense, the situation of the post-war capitalism was a situation which was a very specific conjuncture in which you actually had decolonization. Winston Churchill, as you know, was completely opposed to decolonization. So, so you had decolonization. You had a certain amount of concession to the workers in terms of welfare state measures, high levels of employment, etc. Uh, and all this was made possible because the state was active state intervention in the economy be had become the norm. But on the other hand, this is something which was accompanied by a building up of liquidity in the system, building up of dollars, which banks wanted to invest in very many different ways, and the Bretton Woods system was one that stood in the way, and ultimately, therefore, in the context of the inflation that took place in late 60s and early 70s, that system was discarded and a new one was put forward in which these restrictions on global financial flows were removed. Not only were restrictions removed on global financial flows, but restrictions were also removed on global capital flows. So the why question is to do with, if you like, in a sense, the normal functioning of capitalism was resumed, while I would see the post-war period as a very special period in which there was a change that had taken place in the correlation of class forces, both within advanced capitalist countries and between advanced capitalist countries and the third world countries. State intervention in demand management in the advanced countries was accompanied by state intervention of a kind which in India one might call a sort of Nehruvian strategy. I don't mean the strategy that was only in Nehru's lifetime, but roughly the entire strategy prior to the introduction of neoliberalism in 1991. So, uh, the statist strategy, if you like, or the dirigist strategy, that, that basically the state played an important role in that period, both in the advanced countries as well as here. Now, one of the implications, as I mentioned, of this statist strategy in countries like India is the support that the state provided for petty production and peasant agriculture. Let's just go back a little. You see that, that the anti-colonial struggle in India had taken off in a very big way uh, in the 1930s. And one of the reasons it took off in a very big way in the 1930s is because the peasantry joined it in large numbers. I mean, you know, the, it, it evoked a lot of support among the peasantry and, you know, Gandhi's role was to successfully carry the message of the anti-colonial struggle to the peasants. How come the peasants suddenly became so much a part of the anti-colonial struggle? I, I believe it is linked to the fact that in the 1930s during the Great Depression, there was a severe assault on the living conditions of the peasantry. 
and this is clear in terms of the growing indebtedness of the peasants against which as you know in Punjab there was the Sir Chotu Ram who, who set up the Punjab Debt Relief Commission in Bengal Fazlul Haq had set up a debt relief commission the fact that all these governments felt compelled to set up these debt relief commissions was because of the fact that the peasant debt had assumed extraordinary proportions so the peasantry, because terms of trade went against the peasantry and therefore even to maintain its normal purchases, the peasantry had to incur larger loans. So the peasantry had been hard hit by the Great Depression. It is for that reason that it had actually joined the anti-colonial struggle in very large numbers. And one of the promises of the anti-colonial struggle was that when independence comes, you are not going to face such a fate ever again. And this is something which is not only in India, but in most other third world countries, a very similar scene enacted itself. And therefore, when independence did come, the state played, uh, uh, did a number of things, all of which were meant to support the peasantry and petty production generally. By petty production, I mean handloom weavers, I mean hand spinners, I mean craftsmen, I mean fishermen, etc. Just consider agriculture. In agriculture in India, for instance, you had protection from international prices, both in terms of very high levels of tariff protection as well as quantitative restrictions on imports and exports. That means world prices may collapse, but Indian prices did not collapse because they were uh, protected against world price fluctuations of the sort, the collapse of the sort which had actually happened in the 1930s. You had the government investing in irrigation and rural infrastructure to an extent unprecedented in colonial India. You had the government research and development establishments researching on new seeds and new practices and you had a massive public extension service system through which the new practices and seeds and so on were made available to the peasants. Multinational corporations were not allowed to approach the peasants. Not only were multinational corporations not allowed to approach the peasants, even the Indian corporate capitalists were not allowed to approach the peasants. Between the capitalist sector, both domestic and international on the one side, and the peasantry on the, on the other side, the state interposed itself. You had uh, subsidized inputs being provided to the peasantry, including subsidized credit after bank nationalization. You had price support, remunerative prices being provided to the peasantry under, for food grains and, and, and about 22 other crops including coconut and so on uh, through the Commission on Agricultural Costs and Prices which actually decided every year what the procurement price is going to be and the government procured the crops at that rate and also for a whole range of cash crops through these commodity boards, you had tea board, coffee board, rubber board, coir board, etc. And all these boards had a marketing function whereby in case, um, in case the price dropped, they would actually buy the crops from the peasants. Okay. Then you had, um, um, okay, so the, all this of course did not mean that all segments of the peasantry were equal beneficiaries. Obviously, the better off ones were far more the beneficiaries of such schemes than the poorer ones. Also, it did not mean that within peasant agriculture or within the agrarian economy, capitalist tendencies did not exist. Uh, 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 you know, the development of capitalism. Development of capitalism occurred because the landlords which had, who had not lost their land, in other words, I'm not talking about the old feudal landlords, but a large number of landlords converted themselves to capitalist landlords. They, they went in for commercial capitalist cultivation. And likewise, even among the peasantry, a segment of the rich peasants, uh, which could take advantage of, 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 of these measures, really developed into capitalist or proto-capitalist farmers. 
But that development of capitalism within the agricultural sector was quite different from the encroachment of capitalism from outside of agriculture. You didn't have corp you didn't have Ambani's going and dealing with the peasantry. You didn't have Monsanto going and dealing with the peasantry. But what you had was a tendency towards development of capitalism and agriculture emerging from within the agricultural sector itself. Now, all these measures have been nullified and negated in the recent period. Every single one of these. You now have a situation where public research and development as far as agricultural practices is concerned, has dwindled into insignificance, taken a back seat. Now you have new seeds coming and being provided by agribusiness, by, by, by companies like Monsanto, who have made a direct entry into the agricultural sector. You have agribusiness, including Indian corporates, buying crops from the worker, from, 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 from the peasants. Public extension services have completely disappeared. Government's capital formation in the agricultural sector in real terms has gone down quite significantly. Input subsidies have been cut quite sharply and as far as subsidies on credit is concerned, it is dwindled into insignificance because now institutional lending by banks to the agricultural sector has disappeared. What you have instead is the peasants increasingly going to private money lenders. Many banks like the ICICI bank for instance actually operate through what they call facilitators who are middlemen between them and the peasants and consequently they really operate as a new breed of money lenders. And these moneylenders charge exorbitantly high interest rates as far as the peasants are concerned. The marketing function of all the boards that used to look after cash crops have gone. You, 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 you don't have, I mean the boards exist, tea board, coffee board etc. exist, but they no longer fulfill any marketing function. That they don't actually, in the face of crashes in world market prices, they don't go and, 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 and provide any support as far as the peasantry is concerned. Even the degree to which food grain can be procured is something which, as you know, is a subject of huge debate in WTO negotiations because they are saying that India cannot, even to feed its public distribution system, procure food grains at the prices it has been doing because that would be unfair trade. So for all these reasons now, agriculture has become an unprofitable operation. In other words, there are two different ways in which agriculture, peasant agriculture is hit. One, I would say, is in flow terms, namely that, that agriculture has become unprofitable. That means the incomes of the peasantry have got squeezed relative to, let's say, that of the corporate sector in this period. The second is, of course, in stock terms, namely a whole lot of peasant assets, particularly land, is now being sought to be taken over for purposes of industrialization and to facilitate capitalist investment at prices which really are a throwaway price relative to the prices that come to prevail in the market. Now this is something against which as you know there has been massive peasant resistance and an ordinance passed by the current government to, 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 to facilitate land transfer has not yet been converted into a bill because one of the things which, you know, make in India or whatever, if you want to become a good destination for investment, global investment, then this is, requires that acquisition of land should be easy, but any such easy acquisition of land immediately brings the peasantry face to face with the problem of uh, having to part with its assets at, at, at low prices. So for all these reasons, you find the peasantry is under enormous squeeze, both in flow terms and in stock terms. This squeeze is what Marx had referred to as
primitive accumulation of capital. When, when, when capital accumulates at the expense of the pre-capitalist sector, then that accumulation is what Marx had called primitive accumulation of capital. It can occur in flow terms through unequal exchange, for instance. It can occur by reducing the profitability of agriculture. It can occur in stock terms by taking over the assets of the petty producers at substantially low prices. Now, the entire colonial period had been a period of primitive accumulation of capital because the colonial administration, in fact, just taxed the peasants. So, the entire colonial taxation system, which produced the drain out of the country, was really an expression of a process of primitive accumulation of capital. And this is something which had squeezed Indian agriculture very sharply, and I'll give some figures by and by. Uh, the period immediately following decolonization was one in which, if you like, this process of this process of primitive accumulation of capital, namely the existing capitalist world encroaching upon petty producers and squeezing them both in stock and flow terms is something which was arrested. That arresting is gone with neoliberalism. You see, we, 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 we tend to think of neoliberalism and India's entry into globalization or other countries' entry into globalization only in terms of whether it's, it's, you know, kind of making possible investment, facilitating and so on. But a very important component of it is making it possible for the capitalist sector to encroach upon petty production, traditional pre-capitalist petty production sector. This is true not only of peasant agriculture, and, and, and it's well known when you compare census data, that people are leaving agriculture and migrating to the cities in search of jobs, and these jobs don't exist, as, as, as I'll discuss in a moment, and, and why not. Uh, but it's also true of other sectors. You look at other sectors, for instance, earlier you had reservation of certain kinds of textiles for the uh, traditional sector. <coughs> Those reservations are gone. Earlier, you had, for instance, fishermen being protected in very many different ways uh, through subsidized inputs and so on that is gone. As a matter of fact, we once made a calculation for Kerala that if you look at the fisheries sector in Kerala and you impute for every traditional fisherman the minimum wage of the state, then you find that the entire sector is in deficit, which means that every fisherman, and the, the, the average fisherman earns a daily rate of return, which is lower than the minimum wage, lower than the statutory minimum wage of the state. So you find that the, fisher, the fishery sector is, is, is an, you just go anywhere and you find the same story. You look at Banaras uh, silk weavers, you find the same story. Everywhere, the traditional petty production sector is under a drastic squeeze because state support has been withdrawn from this sector. And one of the reasons for the withdrawal of state support from this sector is the fact that the state that was committed to supporting them as a part of the anti-colonial struggle and did so during the statist period now has changed its economic strategy where the strategy is one that is more or less to meet the demands of finance capital and of course supporting all this is not a part of the demand for finance capital on the other hand making it possible for agribusiness to encroach upon the traditional agricultural sector is what neoliberalism demands and is really in keeping with the new kind of economic strategy many people actually go to the other extreme and many people actually say that look what's wrong with this why don't we open up Indian agriculture to multinational corporations who can then raise agricultural growth to a much greater extent than peasant agriculture is capable of doing? And if so, then the growth rate of the economy would increase. And if so, ultimately, people would become better off that way than they currently are. The problem about this is that it misses a very basic point, namely that the peasants who are displaced 
if multinational corporations come and take over their land for agricultural purposes, would simply find no employment because a high rate of growth of GDP does not mean a high rate of growth of employment. Let me try and, 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 and explain why this is not the case. You see, I would be perfectly amenable to the argument that we don't have to shed tears if the traditional producers are no longer viable because after all capitalism, if it is expanding at their expense, can in fact absorb them as, 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 as laborers. Many people argue that this is exactly what happened in European American capital, I mean, let's say in metropolitan capitalism in Britain, in Europe, this is exactly what happened because after all, you had traditional petty producers being displaced, but they subsequently got absorbed as laborers in the growing capitalist sector so that you actually had an overall modernization of the economy together with the structural change. Now, this argument misses the point in two very significant ways. One way it misses the point is that, you know, that if you look at what happened in metropolitan capitalist countries is not the usual story told. The usual story says, all right, capitalism got rid of traditional producers, but on the other hand, they joined the capitalist sector as laborers. That's not what happened. There was a huge emigration from Europe to the temperate regions of settlement like the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on. Huge. And therefore, a lot of the pressure was taken off the labor market. Supply-side pressure was taken off the labor market. According to Arthur Lewis, a, a development economist, very well-known development economist, got a Nobel Prize as well, uh, 50 million Europeans migrated out of Europe in the period between, I mean, in the, in, the, in the period of the 19th, a long 19th century, that means right up to the First World War. An estimate for Britain alone suggests that if you take between 1815 and 1910, the people who migrated out of Britain over this entire period would roughly, in numerical terms, equal half the increase in population every year. Now, if you made a similar calculation for India, between independence and now, about 45 crores of Indians should have migrated, if migration on that scale was possible. But it's not possible. And consequently, the, 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 the argument which is often put forward that, look, this is just part of the nature of capitalist development. It first destroys um, kind of, you know, small petty producers. But on the other hand, subsequently, it actually reabsorbs them as laborers. This is not the normal capitalist. This, this is not necessarily embedded in the normal functioning of capitalism. The fact that metropolitan capitalism did so is because of the availability of these temperate regions of settlement in which the people went uh, from Europe, got rid of the local inhabitants, got hold of land, set themselves up, up, set themselves up as farmers, and therefore enjoyed a level of per capita income that even pushed up the reservation wage in Europe itself. Because obviously, if I can migrate to the United States and get 100 rupees a day, in that case, I'm not going to be in, in Europe earning or, or in, in Britain earning 20 rupees a day. Then I'd rather migrate. So the reservation wage of the workers, what they're willing to accept, was itself lifted by the availability of migration possibilities. Those possibilities no longer exist today. You may say, but even if they don't exist today, why can we not still have capitalist development that actually uh, impacts upon unemployment? The fact that it does not is pretty obvious. Let me just give you uh, some figures from India. Firstly, what do we mean by unemployment? I mean, I think we should be very careful. What exactly do we mean by unemployment? When somebody is without work, that person is not just without work. Well, that person then does some little thing somewhere. During the Great Depression in Britain, for instance, 
a lot of the unemployed people set themselves up as shoe shine boys. Okay, so you can say there is a lot of unemployment, or you could say there's an enormous increase in employment in the shoe shine sector. So, so which of these you say? requires therefore a critical look at the nature of employment. I mean you can't just say that you know that because since unemployment is never openly un expressing itself as unemployment you have to have some critical criterion in terms of which you can define if people are employed or unemployed. Now in India there is one uh, there are various concepts of unemployment and one of the concepts of unemployment because here again when people come to um, cities, if there are no proper jobs, then they become thugs, hoodlums, beggars, all kinds of things, okay. So you have to somewhere define, or, 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 or you can have proliferation of casual employment, I'm, I'm kind of carrying some load today, tomorrow I don't have anything, day after I get something, etc. Casual uh, employment or intermittent employment or, you know, sporadic employment, etc. Uh, you therefore have to have some criterion for judging what is the proper growth of employment. I suggest we take a very simple criterion. The National Sample Survey in India talks in terms of usual status employment. That those who consider their usual status as being employed. That's one way of doing it. You look at the growth of usual status employment between 2004-05 and 2009-10 because National Sample Survey has big samples every five years. They, they do very big sample surveys every five years, 2004-05 to 2009-10. They go around asking questions, uh, you know, what is your usual status? This period, 2004-05 to 9-10, remember, was a period in which the Indian economy was growing very rapidly, okay. That was the period in which, um, you know, uh, what was that slogan which was done for the 2004 elections? India shining. India shining, exactly. India shining slogan was very much current and, you know, it experienced 7 8% growth rates. If you look at those five years, then you find that the, pro that the r usual status employment increased at the rate of 0.8% per annum. When you had the economy growing at 7 to 8% per annum GDP, usual status employment increased at 0.8% per annum. Now, our population growth, let's say, is 1.5% or a bit less than that per annum. Workforce growth rate would be roughly, let us say, of that order. Additionally, as I mentioned, you have many displaced petty producers, including displaced peasants. Census data clearly reveal this. They, there's a decline in the number of peasants. So many of them have come to the cities in search of employment. So the rate of growth of <coughs> labor supply is, 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 is certainly more than 1.5% per annum. But the rate of growth of proper labor demand is not even zero, is, is just about 0.8 percent per annum, which basically means that there is huge excess supply in the labor market, which makes itself felt in terms of, as I said, casual employment and, you know, intermittent employment, etc. When this happens, not only is there a reduction in the standards of living of people who, let's say, have got displaced from agriculture compared to what it would have been or was before the squeeze on agriculture began. But what is more, this also puts a pressure as far as employed workers are concerned because trade union movement cannot survive if you have huge labor reserves. Workers can't demand higher wages successfully if you have huge labor reserves, which is just the opposite of what I said was happening in the period, certainly in the advanced countries during the golden um, age of capitalism. So you find that, that even organized workers don't experience an increase in their real wages. And of course, as far as the rest of the working class is concerned, workers at large, there is a reduction which takes place in their real incomes over a period of time because there is a proliferation of labor reserves. Now, this 
you may wonder why why should it be the case that when you have 7 to 8 percent growth rate of GDP, you only have 0 0.8 percent growth rate of, of, of proper employment, I mean, employment proper. And I think this is a very important question. Obviously, let's begin with a simple algebraic truism, namely that the rate of growth of employment is the rate of growth of GDP minus the rate of growth of labor productivity. Okay, that's, that's very straightforward. If you have 7 to 8 percent growth rate of output and you have 7 to 8 percent growth rate in labor productivity, then you have zero rate of growth of employment. Okay. The fact that you have very low employment growth is really symptomatic of the fact that you have, along with high GDP growth rates, very high levels of labor productivity growth rates. Okay. Now, there is a conception which most people have, which our leaders certainly have, and they're forever exhorting the country to have high rates of labor productivity growth, that high rate of labor productivity growth is unambiguously good. On the contrary, since the rate of growth of employment is just the rate of growth of output minus the rate of growth of labor productivity, a high rate of labor productivity growth for any given rate of GDP growth implies that your employment does not grow. I hope I'm making myself clear. This is something, oddly enough, Gandhiji knew. And that's why he had actually said that, look, I mean, you know, let us have some restraints as far as the pace of technological change is concerned. I'm not saying that's the best way of solving it, but, but, but he, was unaware, he was aware acutely of this problem. And when, in correspondence, Tagore pointed out that, look, I mean, you know, but this basically means that, okay, Gandhi was talking against machine-made cloth and so on. Most of it was imported anyway. When Tagore pointed out, and Tagore, uh, as you know, his, his, his novel Ghore Bairi was concerned with this, uh, his argument was that, look, machine-made cloth, which is imported, admittedly, is of a superior quality compared to the cloth that is woven by the handloom weaver. How can you deprive the peasants from this superior quality cloth in the name of the defending the handloom weaver's livelihood because then you are attacking the peasant's livelihood. To that Gandhiji's answer was that look how can I feel comfortable in my fine machine made cloth if my brother the weaver is starving because of this. Uh, so, so, but, but he was at least aware of the fact that the pace of structural change being rapid the pace of technological change being rapid, and by structural change I mean substitution of one kind of product for another kind of product, is something which actually would go against employment prospects. Now when we therefore unambiguously applaud high rates of labor productivity growth, we are showing an ignorance about its employment effects which is really quite surprising in a country in which the whole freedom struggle saw debates of, of, of that kind emerging. Now there is a vicious circle here which I'd like to draw your attention to. That vicious circle is the following. Just imagine, I mean let's just do it as a thought experiment. Suppose it is the case there are lots of labor reserves, okay. If you have lots of labor reserves then there is no increase as far as the wages are concerned, I mean, real wages because the trade unions can't demand higher real wages and succeed in enforcing it. As far as others are concerned, then the real wage level certainly does not rise. Now suppose you have an increase in labor productivity. If real wages don't rise and you have an increase in labor productivity, that basically means the surplus, output minus wage bill increases. Okay. This surplus accrues to the capitalists' profits and to a whole lot of other people who, 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 may, who may constitute, you know, kind of uh, uh, an army of people, lawyers, chartered accountants, etc., all of whom are basically uh, constitute the white collar service providers for capitalism. Now, typically, the propensity to consume 
new goods, modern goods, technologically sophisticated goods, and therefore less employment intensive goods is greater among the latter than among the former. In other words, if you have, uh, let's say, a laborer, an ordinary common worker who is given a rupee, that common worker given the rupee might go and buy a jhadu, might, might go and buy a, whatever, you know, some, some normal or some utensils which actually increase domestic employment. On the other hand, if you give the same rupee to somebody who lives in New Delhi, who is a lawyer, let's say corporate lawyer, that corporate lawyer is likely to, for instance, go for a holiday in French Rivera with his wife with this kind of rupee, which generates very little employment domestically. The employment intensity of a rupee which comes as purchasing power to the surplus earners is less than the employment intensity of a rupee that comes to the wage earners. It's another thing also that the surplus earners would be saving a part of the rupee, which I'll come to in a moment. But suppose we forget about savings. Even so, this would be the case. Now suppose this happens. Then if you have a shift in income distribution, then that basically reduces employment intensity, increases the rate of labor productivity growth. And if so, then you find we began with labor reserves. With the labor reserves, wages had remained low, surplus had increased. With the increase in surplus, we find an increase in labor productivity. That perpetuates the labor reserves. If it perpetuates the labor reserves, then wages remain where they were. Labor productivity growth further increases and therefore you have a vicious cycle. You actually have a situation where labor reserves remain unexhausted forever. And this is something which we have been witnessing. Income distribution shifts, in other words, also have an effect on employment growth. And employment growth has an effect on income distribution shifts. If employment is not growing rapidly, then income distribution shifts in favor of surplus. And if income distribution shifts in favor of surplus, then employment doesn't grow rapidly. And therefore, you have a vicious circle where there is a general situation where labor reserves in economies like ours never get exhausted. And the same is true of most third world economies. There is a view that is not true in China. A lot of debate has taken place on it, but I remain skeptical even about China. I certainly know that in India, where we have these data, labor reserves remain unexhausted. And this is the reason why you find that there is a rise in, in uh, inequality in income distribution and an inequality in wealth which is occurring in all these countries. Now this is one part of the story, namely that you know that because of uh, because of these changes that we are we are talking about, even though you can have high levels of GDP growth, the high levels of GDP growth still do not have an impact as far as labor reserves is concerned, exhaustion of labor reserves is concerned. Now I want to come to another part which I think is, 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 is significant and that's really the international part. If you look at the history of capitalism, then for a very long period of time, even though Capital was, okay, labor was never allowed to move from the colonies and semi-colonies of the tropics to the temperate regions. I said that there was a huge migration from the temperate regions of metropolitan capitalism like Europe and so on to United States, Canada, etc. So there's a huge migration stream taking place in the 19th century encompassing the, the temperate world. There's a parallel migration stream that takes place in the 19th century at the same time encompassing the tropical world where Indian workers go as indentured laborers, 
Chinese workers go as coolie laborers to other tropical or subtropical regions. Indian workers go to the West Indies, they go to Fiji and so on. And likewise, Chinese workers go to various places, including even California under the gold rush. So, so you have a tropical migration stream and a temperate migration stream. These two are kept strictly separate. And they are kept strictly separate to this day. Namely, that a person from the tropics finds it very difficult to migrate to the temperate regions. The migration there is dictated by the demand pattern. If the United States needs doctors, then of course doctors are allowed to migrate. But there is no easy migration of labor from the tropics to the temperate regions like there is within the temperate region. Okay? There is migration of workers within the tropical region. But of course, that is something that nonetheless keeps the tropical migration a low wage migration, while the temperate migration, for reasons I've already discussed, was a high wage migration because you got land in the temperate regions. So labor was not allowed to move from the tropical colonies and semi-colonies to the temperate regions. Capital was allowed to move. There were no restrictions on British investments in India in the colonial period, but it did not move. Simply, it did not move. Why it did not move is something which has been a subject of long discussion, but let's not get into that. As a result, the world remained segmented, namely that you had, because of de-industrialization I discussed earlier, big labor reserves occurring in the tropical countries, but very little industrialization, very little new development because capital was not allowed to move here. On the other hand, precisely because labor was not allowed to move and capital remained confined within the temperate regions, you actually had a situation where trade unions could, could come up, real wages could increase when you had labor productivity rising, etc. The division of the world into an advanced set and an underdeveloped set into a set of advanced countries and a set of underdeveloped countries is a division which arose because of the segmentation of the world economy. Otherwise, instead of the British textile industry being located in Lancashire, all of it would have migrated to Bombay or, or, to, or to Ahmedabad and so on. That did not happen. So you have a situation where the world economy had remained segmented for a very long time. In the current globalization, that segmentation is being dented. Now, for the first time, you find American companies taking advantage of low wages in China or India or Bangladesh or, 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 or East and Southeast Asia to locate plants there, not for meeting the local market, but for meeting the global market. Okay. So the segmentation of the world economy has actually broken down. What is the implication of it? One very obvious implication is that now workers in the advanced countries are exposed to the baneful consequences of third world labor reserves. Third world labor reserves now do not just keep third world wages low, but they also impinge on the first world wages. Because the first world wages can't rise because then capital would simply shift out and locate its plants elsewhere. As a result, you find that until the third world labor reserves get used up, not only the third world wages remain low, but even the first world wages remain low. Now, this is something which, for instance, Joseph Stiglitz found that in the United States, if you look at the real wage of a male American worker between 1968 and 2011, not only did the real wage not go up, but this real wage marginally declined. It's an amazing phenomenon. So, so, so you find that now in the first world itself, under the current globalization, real wages are affected by the third world labor reserves. I'm not saying that real wages are falling to third world levels. But what I'm saying is that the vector of real wages is just not going up anywhere in the world, neither in the third world nor in the first world. But labor productivity is going up everywhere. 
if labor productivity is growing up everywhere and the vector of real wages is not going up, then of course the share of surplus in output is going up everywhere. Now, I have discussed one implication of the share of surplus in output in terms of its employment intensity of the product mix that is demanded. But another very important implication of this, of, of, of this is, is, is the fact that out of a rupee which accrues as surplus, more is saved compared to a rupee accruing as wage income. As a result, this income distribution has an aggregate demand compressing effect in the world economy. I hope I'm making myself clear. Now, one aspect of this income distribution shift, which has been much talked about by Piketty and others, namely that income inequalities have increased everywhere. But another aspect of this is that the increase in income inequalities also implies a compression of demand, a relative compression. It has, it has a demand compressing effect. This demand compressing effect could have been overcome if you had had state intervention like you had in the golden age period. But that is no longer possible for reasons I've discussed, namely globalization of finance comes in the way of state intervention in demand management because the states are nation states. And there is no global state, there is no coordinated action even by individual nation states coming together to boost world demand. And all this basically implies that this demand compressing effect has pushed contemporary capitalism into a crisis. Now, the structural genesis of this crisis is such that for some time it was camouflaged in the 1990s and, and, and earlier this century through the formation of asset price bubbles. That in the United States you first had the dot-com bubble, then you had the housing bubble and an increase in asset prices which basically build upon them, this increase builds upon itself and therefore you have really, that's why it's a bubble, you have the building of an asset price bubble, it increases apparent wealth in the hands of many people and to the extent that happens, their expenditures go up, their consumption goes up, to the extent financial asset prices uh, rise that makes borrowing cheaper, therefore investment goes up, etc. So a bubble can sustain a growth which it did in the 90s and 2010, uh, in uh, sorry, the first decade of the two of, of the current century. But as the bubble collapses, the basic structural crisis of the world economy stands revealed and exposed. And that's what we are seeing today. You can't, so you could get out of the current crisis through the formation of a new bubble. But you can't hold a gun to people's heads and say, now speculate and start a new bubble because it may or may not happen. And if it does happen, then again, it might actually collapse and once more expose the world economy to another crisis of the sort that we have. So the period of globalization has meant that both in the advanced countries and in the developing countries, there is a squeeze as far as the working people are concerned. On the one hand, there is no increase in the real wage rate. The share of real wages has diminished everywhere. And in countries like ours, there is a pressure on the petty production sectors as well, peasant, traditional, I should say, peasant agriculture, you know, the fishermen, craftsmen, and so on. So if you take the working people as a whole in societies like ours, and the working class, well, because peasantry and so on are very minor uh, features of those economies in the advanced countries, there is a squeeze on them. And this squeeze is something which is compounded by the kind of crisis which we are currently exposed to, a crisis that has arisen because of, specifically, immediately, because of the collapse of the bubble.